picture of common battlefield weapons, is it? It's a picture of praying hands. And when, um, when I looked for a picture, I was looking for something that would, would, would give us an image uh, on spiritual warfare. That said, spiritual warfare, the heart of spiritual warfare is right there, isn't it? I've said it's about, it's about obedience, isn't it? It's about submission. It's about using the different things that God has given to us. And all that comes together when we pray. When we pray, we are going into spiritual battle. There's a warfare that's happening around us, and prayer is the incredible energy. In fact, we're going to look at that throughout today. Prayer is a mission. It's, it's designed, folks, for the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. We advance the kingdom of heaven as we pray. Prayer is critical. In, in fact, if you look at uh, the text, and we're going to read just a little bit more than I've got listed on your bulletin. Ephesians 6, I'm going to back up to verse 10. I want you to see again the context. If you look at all of the book of Ephesians, Paul is talking about the body of Christ, the unity of bo- the body of Christ, the, the gifts that God has given to that body, the responsibilities he's given to that body. Uh, he, he talks about submission in its various contexts. The husband-wife relationship at the end of Ephesians 5. He talks about submission, the, the servant and master role, the, the boss and employee role. Uh, he talks about the church. And, and then he comes to this section and he says, verse 10, Finally, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And now he's going to explain how you can be strong in the Lord, how you can do that in his mighty power. And what does he say? Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual realm, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a spiritual battle going on, whether you want to admit it, whether you like it, whether you're afraid of it or not, it's going on around us. And he's saying, look, you need to stand firm against it. You need to get ready for that battle. There are tools and resources that you have to fight that battle, but you got to do it. Now he goes on, he says, therefore, because we're in this battle, deny it even if you want to. Pretend there's no Satan and you're in trouble. (laughs) Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then. How? How? And notice now, in the last of just two sentences, he's used stand, what is it, three, four times? He wants us to be ready to fight the battle. And he says, now here's how. Put on the full armor of God. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. And your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. Now, you need to take note there. Our English starts to put periods and commas and quotes. It's not all in the Greek, is it? Listen to this right here. Listen to this, this, just this one verse. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That goes together, doesn't it? Let's take note of that. Helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, and pray with all kinds of prayers. It goes together. With, all, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Dr. Peck, uh, a psychologist, scientist, basically, says that if, you, that if you can walk into a room, and have you noticed you can feel something in a room when there's a bunch of people there? A room can feel, oh, it's happy in here, or, ooh, 
There's something pervading in here. There's something negative in here. And, and people can feel that. Girls, you tend to do it better than us guys. But, but we all can feel it. Come on, if you were at the Dodger game on the, on the sixth game, if you were at the Dodger game on the sixth game, she, okay, she's gloating over there. Okay, so for those of you who are for the Dodgers, stay away from Leslie. Okay, so, she, so if you were at the sixth game, and, and, the, and you were watching them, and you were a Dodgers fan, you could feel excitement there. In fact, um, Lauren Tovar, the principal at uh, Valley of Enchantment Elementary School, said she was at the second game. And the second game, she said, oh, man, it was exciting. It was electric. They had the big flag there on the, on the outfield and, and the, the flyover of the Jets, and there was just something exciting there. She said that wasn't there, by the way, the night of the seventh game. <laughs> Before the game ever started, she said it felt different. You see, when Peck says, you can walk and you can, you can sense things, you can feel things, you can, it, it, and, and the fact is, is that Christians, some Christians, not all, but some Christians have been given this supernatural ability to discern spiritual forces even in a room. In the uh, Lausanne Covenant back in 1974, Christians gathered from around the world, the very first gathering of its type, evangelists from all over the place. And, and um, Billy Graham had, and he and others had put this on. And at the end of that, they had a document that they signed about their beliefs. And in it, over 2,700 delegates, um, by the way, I had the privilege of being there. That shows how old I am, okay? <laughs> Um, as a student uh, representative, it, it said this about uh, statement number 12, spiritual conflict. I'm just reading part of it. It says, we believe that we are engaged in constant spiritual warfare with the principalities and powers of evil who are seeking to overthrow the church and frustrate its task of world evangelization. Delves with God's armor and to fight this battle with the spiritual weapons of truth and prayer. For we detect the activity of our enemy not only in false ideologies outside the church, but also in false gospels which twist, twist scripture and put people in the place of God. We need both watchfulness and discernment to safeguard the biblical gospel. What did Jesus tell Peter? Peter, on this church, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As we've been going through this study, there's something that, that I am convinced of. That is, is that what we believe is built on the authority of the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the truth that Jesus has authority over the enemy. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Evil is real. It also is a, a copy of the real. The powers of darkness do exist. And the Antichrist tries to falsely represent the powers of God. In the Amplified Version, verse 18 comes out this way. Pray at all times for on every occasion, in every season, in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch and with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. In the, in the New Living Translation, it says, pray at all times when on all every occasion in the power of the Holy Spirit. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all Christians everywhere. And in Young's literal translation it says, through all prayer and supplication. Remember what I said earlier? The helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, through all prayer and supplication, praying at all times in the Spirit, and in regard to this, watching in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Folks, we need to stand firm and pray. Our prayer needs to be in the spirit. And we need to understand that when we are praying, we are actually doing spiritual warfare. It is part of the battle. 
We need to pray for discernment so that we can know when there's something spiritual that's occurring around us. And we need to pray for God's anointing to remove the evil. John MacArthur said, Ephesians begins by lifting us up to the heavenlies and ends by pulling us down to our knees and pray. Barnes said, no matter how complete the armor, no matter how skilled we may be in the science of war, no matter how courageous we may be, we may be certain that without prayer, we shall be defeated. God alone can give the victory, and when the Christian soldier goes forth armed completely for the spiritual conflict, if he looks to God by prayer, he may be sure of a triumph. This prayer is not to be intermittent. It is to be always, in every temptation and spiritual conflict, we are to pray. Now, I just got to pause for a minute. That's not a praying about simple little things in other people's lives. So I'm praying for somebody's sore throat. Should I pray for that? It's okay. But if the gist of my praying is about other people's sore throat, I'm missing the depth of what God wants us praying. If I'm not praying and starting to sense the battle that those persecuted Christians are experiencing and being concerned for them and broken for them and sensing what the the spiritual battle that they're facing, that evil is really trying to be victorious, if I'm not praying with that kind of prayer, I'm missing the importance of what God really wants me praying. So he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and supplication, praying at all times in the spirit and being watchful with perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer is our source for supernatural power. With all kinds of prayers, Paul says, with open conversation, with urgent petitions for assistance. How should we pray? We're supposed to be praying in the spirit. Now I might push some of us on this one when we start to think about that, because what does it mean to pray in the spirit? Praying being led by the spirit, praying where we're submitting to the spirit, praying where the spirit is speaking to us, in Romans 8, 26 and 27, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the word of God. To pray in the Spirit is to pray in accordance with the word of God. It's not like the lady who was praying and the young man who were praying that God would protect them and keep them from being arrested because they had murdered her husband. Did you hear that? That was just up here in Helendale. She just got convicted of the death of her husband, of the murder of her husband. Why? Because, and, and they actually have telephone conversations of her and this young man praying together that God would keep the truth from coming out. Oh, how deceived when we can become. To pray in the Spirit is to pray in the will of God. Sometimes to pray in the Spirit is to pray without words at all. Did you hear? The Spirit prays with groanings too deep for words. And if you've been through a painful time in your life, perhaps a grief, a loss of somebody you love, words just couldn't come, maybe only tears. And in those moments, the Holy Spirit is praying on our behalf. See, the Spirit guides our prayers, gives us instruction as we pray. And it's as I meet, I I need to share something. As I meet with people, one of the things, I've, I've done a lot of counseling over the years. And in that counseling, I don't come with a set agenda of what I'm gonna say to somebody. I've got my list of questions that I'm going to ask. No, it's not not that way. Every time somebody comes into that office, every time I sit down with somebody, I've got to say, okay, God, help me to listen to you. I've oftentimes used the phrase, I need to listen with my third ear. I need to listen with the Holy Spirit. I need to let the Spirit of God speak to me. And again and again, questions will come that I had no idea I was going to ask. And those questions will lead 